Today's guest may have been your first therapist, depending on your age. He has been a staple on daytime television for over 25 years, saving countless troubled marriages with his ability to deliver an unapologetic, tough love with a dash of sh- southern charm. He's a no-nonsense guy. He's, you know, um, guided, I don't know, thousands of people who have been struggling with everything from their weight to their relationships. Maybe you can help me on that a bit. Um, before blazing is into his number one television career. He was a successful trial consult- consultant. He, he had clients like Exxon. In fact, one that really put him on the map was his client, Oprah Winfrey. He's a New York Times bestselling author. He has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, founder of a brand new media company here in Texas. He ditched Hollywood for the free state of Texas. So just like he always says to the people on his show, how's that working for you? Dr. Phil, he's got a new book out. It is called We've Got Issues, How You Can Stand Strong for America's Soul and Sanity. This, I think, is a Dr. Phil, at least I haven't seen before. I think you're going to enjoy our conversation. Welcome to the program, Dr. Phil. Before we get to Dr. Phil, let me tell you, last year, because of you, Preborn's network of clinics saw over 58,000 babies saved. Thank you to everybody who made this possible. We should celebrate the lives of the precious babies that were saved and, quite honestly, the lives of the moms. When Charlotte found out she was pregnant, she was seven weeks along. The back of her mind, she had no support from anybody. She thought abortion's going to be the best solution. But then she went into a preborn clinic and they gave her a free ultrasound paid for by somebody like you. And she saw her baby on the ultrasound. She heard the heartbeat and she chose life. Now, She also needed help, so she got all of the postnatal care that she needed and all the way to baby clothes and books and diapers and everything else she might have needed for up to two years. Each of these babies are miraculous, and so are their moms. Preborn celebrates 200 miracles. $28 a day can be the difference between life and death. $28 a month, $28 once When a mom meets her baby on the ultrasound and hears their heartbeat, it is a divine connection. It doubles the baby's chance to life. Will you be the person that either makes a major gift or even a $10 gift to help another mom and baby survive? Just dial pound 250, say the keyword baby. Pound 250, keyword baby, preborn.com slash Glenn. That's preborn.com slash (laughs) Glenn. Dr. Phil, nice to have you here. Thanks for having me. And I, I mean that in two ways, too. Nice, nice to have you in the studio, but also nice to have you in Texas. Well, I'm glad to be back. You know, we're from here. I used to live in Las Colinas. And, uh, yeah, that's uh, where the studio is, yeah, right here. Yeah, right here. So uh, I've actually recorded a couple of audio books in this building. Really? Yeah, a long time ago, right yeah. by the front door there. Really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, uh, <clears throat> it's changed a lot. It was the old Paramount lot, and... I bought it about 10 years ago, and we've changed it a lot, so it's good to have you back. Well, you've done more than change it a lot. You've really built this thing up. It's amazing yeah, thank what you. you've done here. I was in it when it was more warehouse than studio, Yeah. so you've really yeah. turned this into a broadcast center. Yeah, yeah. It's. I mean, it's the this studio <clears throat> is the largest uh, studio in uh, the Americas that's in daily TV production. Yeah. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. Anyway... Uh, I have um, watched you for years, um, but I think you've, you're changing a great deal. Reading the book, <clears throat> We've Got Issues, holy cow, this is not the Dr. Phil. I mean, it is and it isn't. It's not the Dr. Phil that I, I know. Yeah, you you're said it right. It is and it isn't. I mean, it's the same. <clears throat> it's the same kind of common sense, shoot from the hip. Um, but I highlighted a few things I just want to, uh, go through because this is, well, let me just, let me just read this. Um, you said at the very, very beginning that you have been doing this for a very long time. Uh, and you've been listening to people who, uh, have, 
problems, relationship, but you notice something change. What was it? Well, <clears throat> you know, it's been a process, really. And you have to understand, having been doing this for 25 years, or a little more, actually, spending the time I did on Oprah, and then I started my own show in 2002. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I didn't really think about it until I sat down and started timelining this out, Glenn, but... In 2002, the first text message hadn't been sent. There were no text messages. We weren't at all digital. So along about uh, 06, 07, we started to get much more into the Internet. And then 08, 09, iPhone. it was like a bunch of C-130s flew over and dropped smartphones on everybody. Mm-hmm. And that's when I saw as big a change in our society as has happened in my lifetime, for sure. I think as big a change uh, to mankind as has happened since the Industrial Revolution. We think about it. We are walking around with as much computing power in our hand as we had when we did the moonshot. Mm -hmm. And that changed everything. Yeah, and especially with what's coming, uh, they say that the last— 400 years, all of the changes in the last 400 years will now be compressed between right now and 2030, 2035. Yeah. Man is not geared for that. I mean, we are animals and our instincts, everything comes from millions of years of experience we're not ready for this and and it's showing because if you if you look particularly at our young people who immerse themselves in this technology we're seeing the highest levels of anxiety depression loneliness suicidality among our young people starting in 09 010 right after Mm -hmm. we had all of this technology boom that have been recorded, the highest levels that have been recorded since they started keeping records for that sort of thing. Our young people stopped living their lives and started watching people live their lives yes. and comparing themselves to that. But the problem was they're comparing themselves to fictional lives. These aren't real lives. These influencers over there, I've had them on the show that have said, look, I, I, I shoot a video with all these fancy clothes and saying, okay, I'm in a rush. I'm going to the NBA All-Star Game. They say, as soon as the video's over, I carefully take those clothes off because I don't own them. I have to take them back to the store because I just brought them home. Now, I don't have the money for those, so I take them back. I put on my sweats and get on the couch. I'm not going to the NBA All-Star Game. So kids watch this and say, by comparison, what a loser am I? I, yes. I mean, I'm not, I don't have that life. So their self-esteem goes down, their self-worth goes down. By comparison, they get anxious and depressed. And they're comparing themselves to this fantasy life that doesn't even exist. We, we have a place out in Santa Monica where they have a fake fuselage to a private jet that rents out for 15 minutes at a time where these influencers go in and pretend they're on a private jet going to... you got to be kidding no, me. No, they're going to Cabo or going to Aspen. They put on their ski clothes and say, oh, off to Aspen. They'll go in and shoot a whole year's worth of content, changing clothes from beach to ski to whatever. Unbelievable. And publish all of that, and peop- and kids compare themselves to that and say, I don't ever go anywhere. Neither do they. They went over to Santa Monica and shot all this phony content and put it out on the internet like they're some kind of rock star. Unbelievable. You know, when I first got into radio and then later television, um, it took, it was hard work to curate an audience, to know who you were, and right. then to create and, and curate an audience. Now my audience has an audience. Yes. And everything that people used to say about, oh, he's only saying that because he wants to get rich, or he's only saying that because he wants, you know, people to watch him. No, you can't be, you can't be who you are or I am for very long if you're fake, I think. Oh, they snip it out in a hurry. But the people in the audience now who have their own audience, that is what they're doing, and they don't recognize it. And people... They're just, I don't know, it's like we're in some sort of weird nightmare. 
We are, and it doesn't last very long. But the problem is, there's one standing there to take their place as soon as they're gone. They'll yes. get a hundred thousand followers, maybe they'll get five hundred thousand, but they flame out in a short period of time. But then there's the next one coming right behind them. Um, I, I was looking at some stats uh, just today, and it's something like sixty percent of Gen Z, 25 and under, that say they would rather be an influencer than a doctor, a lawyer, Mm. an architect, whatever. They would rather do that, and they honestly think that's going to work. They don't understand how difficult it is to monetize that content, how difficult it is to make that content. They just think, I'll just put stuff up and get money. So when the iPhone first came out, and I noticed everybody started doing this, looking down, um, I said, we are running the biggest experiment on humankind that is ever. We don't know what's, what's going to happen. We're just seeing here, everybody, completely change your life with this. And people thought that was crazy at the time because, you know, it, it does bring a lot of connection you can it was amazing when you could actually see somebody on the other side of the mm-hmm. world that was just an individual telling you what was going on yeah. so is it is it this bad experiment that we're running or is it that and the combination of really bad actors uh that are using knowingly <clears throat> using this and creating such dystopian yeah, it- it's at so many different levels. And look, obviously, there are great advantages to this technology, right? Uh, you know, some kids don't even know what a library is. And if you happen to be listening, it's a big building with books in it. Um, <laughs> Wait, what's a book? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, now, just think how f- much information we have at fingertip. Now, you got to check and make sure that it's not wrong information. Um but, but it, even the stuff that we, because we're digital now, I just, just read this, that information in our libraries, that's solid. But the digital information can easily be manipulated, and some of it is. You look for things that you know you saw. You know it was on the like It's gone. So even real reality is being edited yeah, and it's going to get worse, not better. This AI, and I, I, I've seen myself in ads for products, mm-hmm. and it's me. I, I, when I look at it, it's a deep fake. It looks like me, it sounds like me, and I'm peddling a product I've never seen or heard of. And we send cease and desist letters. Um, it just passes on to somebody and, else. <laughs> they just shut that down and open up. A a new entity, and they're right back at it again. It's like stomping ants at a picnic. I mean, it's you you can't you you can't get rid of them as fast as they pop back up. But obviously, there are huge positives to this. But you ask, is it is it bad actors? Um, There are huge bad actors at every level. I, I I deal with women that get caught up in these romance scams. I've had them that they've worked their whole life. Husband passes away, they get a million dollar insurance policy, they've worked their whole life, saved up three, four hundred thousand dollars, and it's all gone in six weeks. Some Nigerian in some workroom that's got 30 or 40 of them up on their computer connects with them, steals somebody's identity, and they've got a playbook. We actually got a copy of their playbook. And they start scamming these women and take them for every penny they're worth. So there are bad actors in that regard. And then we've got bad actors, I think, in terms of who's running the algorithms. Yeah, you talk, you talk yeah. about that. Is uh, that scary? That is really frightening. Um, I wrote a book a, a long time ago about AI um, and talked about don't fear the technology per se, fear the people who are writing the algorithms yeah. because we don't know their motivation. We may never know who they were, but you wrote um, 
While you're getting fed highly curated, highly filtered information, you aren't getting other information. And you talk about how you're not even in charge anymore. Explain. Well, the thing is, <clears throat> we'll have a feed. You, you, you open up uh, Instagram or TikTok or whatever, and it starts, you start scrolling through, and it's showing you this and showing you that. And you think, well, this is coming from somewhere, and I, I wonder why I'm seeing what I'm seeing. Maybe most people don't wonder why they're seeing what they're seeing. Mm-hmm. But the fact is, um, there. I include a study in here where they opened one up, opened up an account with a 13-year-old girl. They created an account with a 13-year-old girl, just put up her name, and 13 years old. And within minutes, they started feeding her toxic information. Um, just really information that up, was upsetting for her and not in her best interest. So they came back and said, well, all right, let's see what happens if we give a clue about a 13-year-old. So they changed the label to Lauren Lose Weight, gave a clue to the algorithm about what she was about. The amount of toxic information she got within minutes went up like 10x in a matter of minutes they started directing her to 700 calorie diets 400 calorie diets anorexia sites all sorts of things started bombarding her now you say well why would they do that if they show you a box of puppies Hmm. and you think well that's really cute and so you click it a few times you think yeah cute puppies okay but if they show you something upsetting, like sick puppies or abandoned puppies, something that upsets you emotionally, it gets you jacked up, you're going to really start clicking because now you're emotionally invested. And so instead of just kind of clicking and laughing, clicking and laughing, you start really clicking. And the more you click, the more money they make. So they feed these girls this information that gets them emotionally invested, gets them emotionally upset. They stay on longer. They click longer. And what happens, of course, then is more ads come at them and they make more money. Now, they do this knowing, and we've seen the information, that the girls get anxious. They get depressed. Their self-worth goes down. It hurts them to see this. They don't care. It's a money grab. So they continue to feed them upsetting content because they click more and get more ad exposure. And they know that. We've seen the documents that say they know that. So they feed them upsetting information because it creates more ad rev. So your kids are not just seeing what randomly comes at them. They're actually being targeted by harmful information because it creates more money for the major social media platforms. They're knowingly doing that, and your child doesn't know it, and you don't know it, but they're victimizing your child consciously, and you don't know it. And I'm putting it in here because people need to know it. Right, and they, <clears throat> what you talk about here, too, is the censoring of information, uh, stuff that you may not, you may want to know, may not want to know, but it's what they want you to know. And yeah. that censoring of information, especially in, in my world, <clears throat> is, is growing at a dramatic and terrifying pace. It's a, it's a terrifying pace. You know, I spent a lot of time in the litigation arena. Uh, you know, not three minutes from here, I had a company, Courtroom Sciences, Inc. Mm-hmm. We did trial science work, and so we spent a lot of time studying how jurors problem-solve cases. It might be a thousand facts uh, in a case, and we discover that out of that, a, a jury might break this down to maybe 50 or 60 facts, and out of that 50 or 60, eight or 10 may drive their decision. It was our job to isolate what are those eight or 10 decision driving facts and how can they be presented in the most effective way 
and if you if you understand what that what those facts are and how they can be presented most impactfully, then uh, you've got a real leg up. And one of the things we learned real quick is jurors decide cases on what they see and hear, not on what they don't see and hear. So you'll have a lawyer that says, well, we tried to get something in and they objected and there was a big fight and the judge said, well, we can't let that in now, maybe later. And they look at the jury and they say, well, they knew we had something powerful. It, it, we had a big impact. No, you did not. They decide on what they see and hear, not what was implied, not what you inferred. They need to see it and they need to hear it. And if they don't, it doesn't have a lasting effect on them. So people that are censoring and deleting information, making sure it doesn't get in your feed, then I promise you across time, they lose. They lose. They're not. Those are not the decision driving factors in somebody making up their opinion, making forming an opinion, and solving a problem based on that information. And when they're curating this information, when they're choosing what you see and what you don't see, they're forming your opinions. Right. And that's scary. What's frightening to me is they have, you know, you don't think of, but you worked for Exxon. Um, and, you know, did court cases with Exxon. When we used to always look at those companies and go, well, they're not going to lose because they got all the money in the world and they know exactly they can just figure out the jurors and everything else. And that's what you do. But that's what's being done on every American now by our own government and by social media. We have We have gone from this country, and maybe I'm naive, Dr. Phil, but I got to tell you, in 2008, when everybody was starting to be called a racist, I thought, I, I think we're doing really well. We're not perfect, but we're not 1965. You know, I grew up at a time when you, you didn't really notice it. The, the Martin Luther King idea, at least I grew up in Seattle, at least there, it wasn't an issue. And I really thought we were making progress. And then all of a sudden we're being told, you're a racist, you're a racist, you're a racist. And it is some of the greatest psychological and behavioral scientists alive today that are doing it. Well, that's what I call in the book tyranny of the fringe. We, we have these, and, and this is psychopolitics, and I'm not a politician. Talk, talk about it before you start. Tell me what psychopolitics is. You talk about it in the book. I, I do. And a, a lot of this, we, we have to remember... When we talk about Russia, for example, Pavlov, which is one of the greatest behavioral psychologists in the history of the field, was Russian. And so, trust me, they are good at what they do. Mm-hmm. And you know, we, we have a document uh, from the 60s that... I, I talk about it in in the book, um, and they were talking about the sub, subverting American society, American culture, and they they describe it as psychopolitics as well. And they're talking about how you can control the minds and the morale and the emotions of the society, and their conclusion was. They've already done it for us because mm-hmm. they're attacking each other. This is like George Orwell's 1984. Mm-hmm. They may have freedom of speech under the First Amendment, but they're muzzling each other. This cancel culture that we have now is, is an advanced version of what they were talking about with the psychopolitics of the 60s. But when I'm talking about psychopolitics, I'm talking about brainwashing people controlling what people say, what they feel comfortable talking about. Yep. And if they dare to um, if they dare to question what these activists are talking about, what they're pushing, what they're peddling, then they are attacked with a vengeance. They're labeled phobic, they're labeled haters. And it's to the point where they call their job, they yeah. contact their job, they, they get them fired, they get them where their own family won't talk to them. 
And that's not theory. That's happening. I was struck by, uh, I was over in London during Gay Pride uh, week and month. And, I mean, on the castle, on every government building, in every store, they were flying the, the rainbow flag. Everyone. Like, without exception, everyone. And I just, I kept walking down the street. I kept thinking to myself, everyone, everyone wants to fly that flag. And I think it's a lot like the people in Germany that hung the political party flag. They were just saying, leave me alone. I, they, they, I'm fine. Yeah. I, you don't have to mess with me. Um, and it, it is happening. And, and it seems as though there are those who are awake, who see it and see it for what it is. And they're not necessarily political. They just remember what right and wrong is. And then there's those who, I mean, I've done my job for 25 <clears throat> years trying to say, wake up, wake up, wake up. And I don't know if I've made an impact. I don't know how, I don't know how else to say, wake up. It's, it, it is, it's a trance. How, how do you break <clears throat> this? Well, it, it is a trance in, in particular areas. And I, I wonder, uh, because I, my position is this. I want us to deal with the facts. Mm -hmm. Let's deal with the facts. One of the things I talk about in the book, and I, 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 I entitled the book, We've Got Issues, because, I, look, I love this country. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I get hate mail for saying I love this country. I, but I do. I love this country. I stand up when the flag goes by. I put my hand over my heart when they play the national anthem. Um, and I, I love this country enough to acknowledge that we've got problems. Right. I'm not so defensive about it. I, I love it enough to not be defensive about the fact that we got problems. Big problems. And and I, I think that's a good thing to to yes. say, I admit we got problems. I don't have to be defensive about that. Sure, we do. Um, and I, I see things like trigger warnings. Uh, you, the majority of universities, my research has shown me that the majority of universities have utilized or are utilizing trigger warnings. Um, I, I, I saw... A couple of universities are using trigger warnings for Romeo and Juliet, where they say, trigger warning, suicide content. Well, spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Uh, kind of gave the storyline away. Um, but here's my problem. When you research trigger warnings, and please, if you're listening to this, Fact check me, please fact check me. Go to, don't go to Google, go to Scholastic Google. I mean, go another level and research trigger warnings. And you will find that the vast majority, overwhelming body of literature says trigger warnings not only don't work. They make you weaker. They actually make you anxious. They actually wow. create the problem that they were designed to avoid. Now, here's why they don't work. There is evidence-based therapy designed to teach people to cope with things that stress them out, right? Systematic desensitization, mm -hmm. dialectical behavior therapy. What, what, mm -hmm. choose, what There are a number of, of evidence-based therapies to teach people to overcome these stressors in their life. Why? Because you can't avoid them. So what do trigger warnings do? They say, okay, some things are going to come up that might stress you, so we're going to warn you, which is stressful, and you can go over here and sit in a corner and avoid this and pretend it's not there. Problem is, when you get out of college and get out in the real world, that doesn't happen. Well, it's starting to. <laughs> well, sadly. <laughs> yeah. But that pendulum is swinging back. Yes. So you're not preparing people for the real world. These trigger warnings don't work. 
research says they actually hurt and that the better method is to learn to cope with them. So later in life, you're not still paralyzed, whether it's PTSD or whatever it may be, you can have them. And the trigger warnings have been for some really ridiculous things, but assuming that they're for something that was traumatic, you need to learn to cope with that. Now, here's my problem. These universities that are employing them have the same access to the same research that I do. So if I can go out there Mm -hmm. and find out that trigger warnings are contraindicated, that you should not use them, that they actually create problems. They don't help anything. They actually create problems. If I can look that up and find it, so can every university that's employing them. So why are they doing it anyway? Because they're virtue signaling. They're wanting to seem like I am super woke here. I'm I'm prote- I'm really sensitive. I'm protecting all of the students and creating a safe place for them to get an education. The problem is that's not an education. The problem is that's teaching them to go on green and stop on red. Here are the keys. Have a great ride. Mm. That's not the way the world works. Now, if I can look that up and, and find it and see it, so can they. So they are knowingly teaching these people something that doesn't help them and actually hurts them. But you said don't look it up on Google. Scholastic. Um, you, you write, uh, Nathan uh, Sharansky wrote a book called uh, Case for Democracy. In it, Sharansky created what he called the Town Square Test. Explain the Town Square Test. Well, the whole idea here is you, you have to be willing to speak up, speak out, and say what you think. And um, the, the whole idea is that the Internet, for example— should be like a town square, right? Mm-hmm. You should be able to talk about whatever you want to talk about and have an exchange of ideas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good luck with that. It doesn't work that way. Uh, when you put out something that um, is at odds with the agenda, the agenda is intolerant mm-hmm. when you're dealing with the, these activists. And um, I think it was Richard Feynman that said, I would rather have answers that I can't question than questions I can't answer. Yeah. And that's, that's a real problem. If, if you've got answers you can't question, that's worse than having questions you can't answer. Mm-hmm. And that's where we are right now. You've got answers you can't question. And that's worse than having questions you can't answer. You said at one point um, that uh, the town square test, the way to know if you're living in a fear society, is if a person cannot walk into the middle of the town square and express his or her views without fear of arrest, imprisonment, or physical harm. By that definition, we're not living in a fear society, at least not yet. In a fear society, in a real town square, when a person's getting silenced, you actually see them getting attacked or muzzled or arrested or dragged away. This is what I called a few years ago, and got a lot of heat for it, a digital ghetto. Right. The Germans just move people into ghettos. They can talk all they want behind that wall. Mm-hmm. So it was, in effect, erased. The, it, this we're burning books, but not physically. We are we're ghettoizing people, just not physically. Is there a difference? Well, I don't think there's a difference. And and here's the thing: they didn't have. If think about George Orwell's 1984, which was written. Think about how prophetic this was. It was written in 1948, uh-huh. and he talked about. A, Someone would say something they shouldn't say. Mm-hmm. They would fail the town square test, and they would get unpersoned. They would just disappear. I mean, everything, they would disappear from the records. Um, They're just gone. They would just, you couldn't find anything about them. We call it canceling them now. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing as he wrote about in 1948. And they started... Eliminating words from in 
in the book, they started eliminating words, and there was just what they called new speak. Mm -hmm. And you could only use these words and not use any others. Same thing. And people started saying, well, I actually like that because I don't want to have to make any decisions. Just tell me what words I can use, and I'll use those, and then I don't have to think. Um, Wow. And how crazy is that? We have the First Amendment protecting free speech, and we're muzzling each other. It's not the government coming in and taking it away. Right? It's now we're muzzling each other. You say something I don't like, and we will attack you. We will cancel you. We will get you fired. We will get you labeled as a hater. We will get you labeled as phobic, uh, whatever. And you know you'll wear the scarlet letter and be unacceptable anymore. And it's got people. Um, I have one. Uh, statistic in the book that says the percentage of people that are afraid to express their opinion has tripled since 1950. Jeez. So in the last 75 years... And think of 1950 as the beginning of the Red Scare. Yeah. It's tripled since then. People are just saying, I'd just rather not say anything. How you bad th- is that? You don't. You don't have a civilization when that happens. No, you don't. And... What and you're what you're saying is you've been wait, trying to wake people up and have, I mean, don't sell yourself short. You've you've awakened a lot of people. It's a process, and I think that a lot of these activists have pushed too far, too long, right. too hard, and people have started saying, "Wait a minute, you're now messing with my kids. You're messing right. with my education. Too much is too much." Enough's enough, too much is too much. Um, like my grandmother says, you, you quit preaching and go on to meddling now. <laughs> and that's not okay. Right. We, um, there's all kinds of research, historic research, that shows that the final stages of an empire always comes um, at the end with... Uh, Questionable sexuality, questionable, you know, bad morals on sex, um, LGBTQ kind of stuff. And for some reason, that is, that's the last straw that comes before it collapses. Is that true? Do you know? I don't know. But I see, I'm the incurable optimist. And maybe that's a flaw. But... I believe in mankind. I I believe that if if we really want, Mm -hmm. if if we really want this culture, this society to flourish, that we it's it's the number one principle I write in the book. Be who you are on purpose. Don't wake up and ride the river wherever it's going. Um, you know, be who you are on purpose. You, you got to decide what's important to me and what am I willing to do to stand up for that? You know, that's why the subtitle to the book is How to Stand Strong for America's Soul and Sanity. And the soul of the nation is a big word, right? I mean, to talk about the, the very soul of the nation. But when people are trying to rewrite history, biology, uh, science, everything, all of that, how does that work? I mean, (laughs) you 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 don't just decide. um, You know, I don't like the way this is, so I'm going to rewrite it. And it it's not enough to just live and let live. I'm like, if that's what you want to think, okay, that's not enough. we're going to demand that you stand up and say you agree with us. Yeah. It's not enough that you think that you let us think that way. You have to stand up and agree with us. That's where I have a problem. It's in the Bible, <clears throat> Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, the angels come to the door or the, uh, the angel is in the, in the uh, house and the people come pounding on the door offers his son or my, his daughter here, take my daughter. No, the stranger, bring the stranger. He must participate. 
we're in that posi- position right <clears throat> now where it isn't enough. You must. It, I mean, again, I go back to the store owners. How do you get a country that only voted a third for the Nazis? How do you get them to raise their hand and give the Hitler salute? How do you get them? Fear. They were physically beaten in the streets by the SA. We are not physically beaten, but we have a massive <clears throat> psychological game being played. We do. And the, the Internet's the game changer. The social media platforms, the all that are, are game changers. Because think about it, before that, if you were up in Kansas and you were living out on the farm and you had some wacky idea... <laughs> You could tell a couple mouth breathers down at the bar, <laughs> right? And you guys could get out in the woods and talk to each other, and uh, it, that's about as far as it went. But now, you get on the internet, it gets oxygen because you got enough other people that say, "Oh well, I, I want to find a cause. I want to find something that distinguishes me. I want to belong to something," and. That's why I say that I'm so worried that family in America is under attack. Mm-hmm. Religion has dropped below 50% in America for the first time in our country's history. People want to belong to something, somewhere, somehow. And absent a quality choice, they'll grab onto anything. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, here's somebody with a, with, with a wacky idea, and they'll love bomb you and accept you and and tell you, oh, that's great, the way you're thinking, yeah, you, you get me, we're, we're in this together. And so before you know it, those four or five guys out in the woods now are connected with four or five hundred. And in those four or five hundred, um, that's why Richard Allen Ross, who's, I, I think, the best uh, cult guy around, says we've probably got 10,000 cults operating in America oh, yeah. right now because of the Internet. And they'll connect that way, and then maybe once a year they all get together and physically. So is this is this a problem? Because I'm I'm I've been fascinated with technology my whole life, and and I started re- reading Ray Kurzweil back in the '90s, and and what was coming, and AI, and you know ASI, and all of the things that we're now beginning to experience. And it is very hopeful and very, it's miraculous, but it is also deadly. Um, so is it, is it the fact that, I mean, how many movies do you have to watch where you see the AI go wrong? No, how turn the air back on. You know yeah. what I mean? How many times? And we just seem to have this like normalcy bias in a way that this time it's different. It's never different. Yeah. It's never different. No, and I, I, I think the way to inoculate uh, against that is, as I said, we have to ask ourselves, what are we all about? And are we doing anything about what we're about? Are we being who we are on purpose? Are we living with intention? And I, I look at what's being taught in the colleges and universities right now. I I said not long ago that our elite universities were fostering intellectual rot. They're not teaching critical thinking. No. I mean, we we have this invasion of Israel, and, I mean, those were murdering assassins that came in and attacked. Raped, beheaded, <laughs> set on fire. Children in their cribs set on fire. Um, and... I, I said, look, I, I am going to speak about this, and I was speaking to representatives of the Israeli government, and I said, look, I can't talk about this based on descriptions and hearsay. I don't, I don't want to see visual Evidence. proof of this, but I, I can't talk about it if I don't. So the Israeli consulate uh, had the IDF bring to my home here in Dallas uh, classified footage that has not been released to this day. And I watched, and a lot of it was GoPros from Hamas 
Some of it was cell phone video from Israelis that were murdered and fell on their cell phones, and they opened them up and saw what was there, saw what happened. Um, and this, these were not acts of war. And I, as I said, I don't know enough about politics to speak about it. I, I think a lot of people don't that speak about it. Um, I certainly don't know geopolitical uh, dynamics, but I do know right from wrong. I know murder when I see it. Mm-hmm. I, I know when somebody goes into a non-combatant's house and kills an infant and says, well, they're settlers. Um, and it's just wrong. And then I see uh, hundreds of students on campus, some of them, I, I just... I, I see a banner that says uh, gays for Palestine. <laughs> um, Do a little homework. Just a little homework. Seriously? Right. Walk that banner into the Gaza Strip and yeah. see how far you get. Right. You're cheering on people that would sooner kill you than look at you. Yes. Um, and how how have they not been taught critical thinking? and do I do I write off the fact that uh, many Palestinians have been killed, twenty thousand and counting, and many of them children or civilians? No, no, I don't. But being killed in collateral damage from a bomb dropped as an act of war is not the moral equivalent of what was done mm-hmm. by Hamas when they came into Israel. You said a couple of things that are, I think are interesting. You talked about, you know, you're not an expert on it, but you know the difference between right and wrong. I think our society has been trained just to listen to the experts. You don't know. You're not smart enough. You don't know all the information. But you can, as an individual, and must, as an individual, look at the situations, listen to all sides, listen to what's going on, and then make a judgment, not necessarily as the person in charge, but absolutely a judgment if you can tell the difference between right and wrong. If you're murdering and setting babies on fire, I don't need to listen to anything else you say. That's such a violation of right. I've got a moral compass. I, I don't, Does America? I, I think they do, but I don't think that they're finding a voice uh, the way some of the activists are. Why? Because they're not organized. And here's the thing, the activists, the tyranny of the fringe that I talk about in, in, in the book, they have an identified enemy. It's often us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they have an identified enemy. And so once they identify an enemy, then they can rally towards that enemy. They, they, when they have an identified enemy, they'll have a place to go a time to arrive, a mm-hmm. target to focus on. Mm-hmm. Whereas the, 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 this middle America doesn't have an identified enemy. They don't want an enemy. Mm-hmm. America does. Most of Americans don't want an enemy. They want to live peacefully and accept one another and love one another, which I'm so glad about in one sense, but you have to pick your battles. And they're not picking a battle. And so here we've got these this tyranny of the fringe out here that are snipers and they're they're targeting people uh, and they're pushing this narrative. And middle America, millions and millions and millions and tens of millions of people don't have an identified enemy. They don't want to hurt. Anyone? They don't but want to hurt. It also, that they don't know. I mean, you talk about core principles. Mm-hmm. The one thing about America, we didn't agree on anything, on anything, except a few core principles. We enshrined them at, as the Bill of Rights, and <clears throat> all of our laws were based on Judeo-Christian right. principles. Don't kill. You know, don't steal. Don't lie. Those kinds of things were important. We don't agree on the Bill of Rights anymore. We don't even agree that it's a good document. Yeah. How do you bring that back and can it be brought back together? It has to be because, and you know, 
I, I talk about the fact that we, we have to make all, we, we have to choose all behaviors based on results. And that means that we have to support a meritocracy. Look, th this stuff about equality of outcome, come on. I, I mean, if, if you've got a guy sitting home in a beanbag eating Cheetos, <laughs> and he's going to get the same outcome as the person I'm going to sit in the beanbag and eat Cheetos all day, too. Yeah, it, it, he gets the same outcome as the person that gets up at 6 o'clock and goes and yep. totes that bale and, 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 and you know, works at the lumber yard all day or goes to medical school or whatever it is. Um, and you know, I, I saw this happen when they said about mismanaging COVID and spent $5.5 trillion. And again, I'm not being political. I'm being psychological here. When you pay people not to work, and in fact, you pay them more to not work than to work. And when you figure in that gas was 5 6 $7 a gallon in L.A., I... I drove past some stations where it was seven and a quarter. I took pictures because I went home to Robin, said, look at this. Um, and, and they're having to commute. And so it's going to cost them three, four hundred dollars a week to commute. Why do it? Or they can sit home in that beanbag and they get unemployment plus a six hundred dollar a week bonus and then another bonus on top of that. And then they get a stimulus check. For what was it, twelve hundred and fifty dollars per person? Mm -hmm. I, I had some friends with a family of four that, honest to God, they were getting ten thousand dollars. They go to the, and it's, and you destroy it. And when you take all of it together, it was like five point five trillion dollars. Four point four trillion of it went into checking or savings accounts. They didn't spend it on rent and groceries. Mm -hmm. They didn't need it, obviously, because it went into savings. So you're paying people to not work, and then they say, "I don't understand what happened to the supply chain. Why we can't get anybody to unload all of these <laughs> ships out in Long Beach Harbor? Mm -hmm. They're backed up out here for miles, and we can't get anybody to unload them. <laughs> well, why would they? They're in the beanbag." As Dr. Phil is talking about here, our American values are under attack. Let me stop and talk to you uh, for this commercial break for under 60 seconds to tell you about our financial system is also uh, under attack. It is it's absolutely broken and everybody knows it, but nobody knows what to do and nobody wants to speak of it. They're afraid maybe, I don't know, you'll jinx what's really happening and it'll get really bad. Well, it's going to get really bad. It has to before it gets better. You need to move quickly and find the safest ways to invest so you can protect yourself and your family from whatever dark day lie ahead. Because the sun does come up, we all survive. It's just in what condition do we get to the other side? That's why I recommend you protect your hard-earned savings with an asset you can trust, gold. I made my very first gold purchase uh, in the days when I was listening to Rush Limbaugh, I think back in the very late 90s, early 2000s. And uh, I was listening to Rush, and he talked about Lear Capital. It was his sponsor of gold for a very, very long time. The person I called at Lear Capital still works there today. And the investment I made has, I mean, it's I bleed crazy. It's maybe five times as much. Lear helped me prepare for the coming insanity. They can help you do the same thing. Don't wait around for things to get worse. Do what's right for you and your money today. I want you just to just to call Lear Capital and just get a, um, a a booklet that they have on on what you can do. Find out if it's right for you. There's no obligation. There's no cost to this. They're going to send you a free booklet. You do your own homework. You talk to your spouse. You pray on it. You'll also, if you decide to buy, Lear will credit your account two hundred and fifty dollars towards your purchase because you got this from me. Call today, 800-889-3070, 800-889-3070, Lear Capital. So you've said several times, I don't want to get political. But in reading your book, you don't talk about politics. There's no left or right in there. No. But it does, and maybe it's because everything is political now, but it does seem, common sense seems political right now. Well, politicians talk about a lot of the cultural issues that I talk about. Right. Um, that's their problem, not mine. I'm yeah. talking about cultural issues in terms of 
the fact that I think family is the backbone of America. And I think families are under attack. They're under attack by the, the big social media platforms. I think they're under attack by these fringe activists. I think they're under attack. Some of it's unintended consequences. Mm-hmm. Some of it's on purpose. Um, and I, I, that's why I say, be who you are on purpose. Decide, uh, my family's going to be pulled together. My family is, we're going to consciously make this family strong again. Um, I, I think you have to make some of those choices. Yeah. You got to support a meritocracy. You, you can I give some of the principles you Please. said? You said I've been working on my uh, ten working principles for a healthy society. Let me give these to you. Number one: be who you are on purpose. That's just a simple conversation that we won't have. With no political party will have this conversation. What do we believe? Do you believe in socialism? Do you believe in some sort of fascism without the the killing centers? Or do you believe in the Bill of Rights and individual freedom? We won't have that conversation. In fact, they'll argue that we can't have that conversation. But that's what we have to have to know who we are. Two, focus on solving problems rather than winning arguments. What a great principle. Isn't that the truth? And, And you can know whether you're dealing with somebody that is trying to win an argument or solve a problem in the first three or four sentences you mm-hmm. sit and talk to them. Because if they sit down and say, okay, how can, how can I help here? How, what can we do together to work on this? If I'm sitting down to negotiate with somebody, the first thing I always do is say, look, we got some differences. We'll get to those. But let's talk about what we have in common first. Let's talk mm-hmm. about what we agree on. Because then we got a foundation to build on. Because mm-hmm. I've never one time done that that we didn't realize we have a lot more in common than we thought we did. Every time you have a conversation with somebody, if they're honest, if they are engaged in an honest conversation, and as you say, not trying to win, yep. you it always works that way. And you don't have to love everything about the other person to love that person. You don't have to like everything they do in order to work with them. Principle number three, don't reward bad behavior or support conduct you don't value. These are so fundamental psychological principles. If your kid's throwing a tantrum in the grocery store, do you go give him a piece of candy? Of course you don't. So why reward bad behavior? Why why reelect politicians that aren't doing the job? If you've got pit bulls walking around your neighborhood, jumping on people and chewing them up, get a new dog catcher. <laughs> He's doing his job. Uh, number four, measure all actions based on results and all thoughts based on rationality. That, that we are told, you don't understand science. Science says there are 93 genders. That, that's not based on anything. No, the... <laughs> it's real easy to check some of these things out. And, you know, rationality sounds like a, a big word. Is it based on verifiable fact? Does it protect and prolong your life? Does it get you closer to what you want and need? You know, th- there, are, th- there are some simple building blocks to answer whether something's rational or not. This isn't a subjective opinion. You can ask yourself, first off, is it based on verifiable fact? And if it's not, get a new thought. <laughs> well, they'll tell you. Let's, let's just we take on an issue that I know you've gotten a lot of heat for. Transgenderism. The American in me says, look, dude, okay, I, that is not my deal, whatever. But don't expect me to say, oh, look at that woman over there. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Don't expect me to say that uh, I have to call you or treat you the same because, honestly, if you actually think you're something trapped inside of your body, you're not. You're not. And there, there might be, but how do you say those things in polite society, our American ethos has always been live and let live. Look, if, if you want to identify as Glenda, 
Yeah. That's up to you. If you want me to say that sex is assigned at birth rather than defined at conception or chromosomally, I, I can't find the science to support that. Right. But if you want to identify differently, I, what business is it of mine to tell you that you can't? Correct. But don't force me to say that it's normal or rational or teach my kids that this is something that you should pursue or even experiment with. And that's number one of rationality. Is it based on verifiable science? It, it, and, you know, I had uh, Dr. Carol Hooven on my show, professor at Harvard, one of the most um, respected and popular um, professors at, at Harvard. And she taught a course in, I think it's, I forget the title, I think it was biogenetics. It's talked about in the book. She was on my show in Fox and Friends and nicest woman. I mean, th- this is a, a sweetheart of a woman's spirit. So smart. I mean, scary smart. Mm. And we had a, a, a transgender woman on that had transgender, um, she had transitioned to a, a male and was a coach. And and was very happy in that position. And when I came to Dr. Hooven, who was going to talk about transgender athletes, I came to her to talk about that. And before she could even answer, she was very emotional and she was talking to this Mm -hmm. coach and said, I'm so happy for you that that Mm -hmm. you're happy. And... I'm, I mean, she was very emotional. Said, so "I'm just so happy for you." She's that sweet. And he said, "Well, um, thank you for saying that." And he said, "You know, there's, you know, th- there are more than two sexes." And she said, "Well, but there aren't." And he said, "Well, yes, there are." And she said, "Well, well, but there aren't." <laughs> and, and she said, I, "I, I'm, I'm just telling you, you'll never be able." to get a biological male to compete fairly Mm -mm. with females. We're seeing that. Um, And she said, I've got the research here. It's not my opinion. I don't care. And he said, well, how many were in your study? He said, well, it wasn't my study. I did a meta-analysis of, I think, 54 studies that looked at all of this. And even with testosterone blockers, like for example, you can't change the wingspan. Mm-hmm. You can't change lung capacity. You can't mm-hmm. change all of these different things. And you can modify it some, but you'll never get on a level playing field. And she even had the percentages broken down. She said, like with swimming, you can get within ten percent, but most swimming events are timed in hundreds of a second. And if it's a two-minute race, ten percent uh, would be twelve seconds. You know, they'd be down there turning around while mm-hmm. he's standing up there waiting mm-hmm. and said, you'll never get it. She got back to Harvard and they lam- labeled her transphobic oh my gosh. and drummed her out of that university after 20 years uh, for being transphobic. And she is so far from transphobic. That is the most you know, accepting woman you could ever meet. I don't know anybody. I'm, I'm sure there are. But I personally don't know anybody when you saw Bruce Jenner and he told his story of, I've been like this my whole life. I feel like I've, I mean, what he spoke about when he was 20, when we were watching him win gold, what was going through his head, I felt horrible for him. I'm like, that's torture. That is just torture. And if he's happy now, that's great. I am happy. But I, I, you have to draw the line and say, look, if I'm bringing you to the hospital, I'm not going to tell them and argue with them that you're the most beautiful woman ever. You're a man. And it's important for them to know because that's science. And look, if, if they want to identify as a transgender female, I, I get it. And I, 
and I talk in the book. I, I say, look, I'm not sure that I'm describing this right, and if not, please help me, because for a long time they did not say that sex and gender were the same thing as mm-hmm. I understood it. And I, I'm, I'm live and let live, um, and there's gender dysphoria, and I'm, I'm worried about what's happening with children if, if they're pushing that. Oh, my gosh. Agenda. I, I just, I, but look, just I'm, the damage. You know, my son at probably seven or eight was exposed to pornography. A babysitter. He was online, and it tore him apart. He he was in a rabbit hole that w- he was seeing hardcore stuff, and it really tore him apart. How can people say that that is good and natural for children to see? I mean, little children. We've known forever. Protect their innocence. Yeah. I I think there's a real problem with what some people are wanting to make available to kids in illustrated books and that sort of thing. Um, let's go to uh, principle number five. Consciously choose which voices are in your life and deserve the most attention. That's stop scrolling. Isn't yeah, it? you bet. Uh, principle six. Don't stay silent so others can remain comfortable. That's really hard. Yeah, that's what we've got to get people to do is 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 be willing to speak up even if it makes other people upset. If it's who you are and what you believe, you've got to be willing to speak it. Um, principle seven, actively live in support of meritocracy. That's what made us. Exactly. Principle eight, identify and build your consequential knowledge. What does that mean? Here's the thing, and, and that's probably an awkward word choice, but I, I meant it to be because I want it to stick out in people's mind. Consequential knowledge is knowledge you have, skill set that you have, talent you have, ability you have, where they can't replace you by noon tomorrow. Mm. If you're working somewhere and your job is opening the gate or filling an order or whatever, they can replace you by tomorrow. If you are a computer repair person or you're you're um, a, a brain surgeon or you're doing something where... If you have the institutional knowledge, just the institutional yeah. knowledge... Is you yeah. don't let that person go. I've had the same assistant uh, that runs my office for 45 years. Wow. And she knows where everything is. <laughs> right. She knows how to get that file cabinet open. She knows how to do this. She knows everybody at every vendor, every account. If if something happens to her, we're just going to have to shut down. I mean, that's, con- that's right. institutional knowledge. But find out what you're good at. And vertically develop at that. There's nothing wrong with being a jack of all trades, but you better be a master of one. Have something you're good at that you can't be replaced by noon tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Find that, develop it, and then you're protected. Last one, principle, oh no, there's two. Principle number nine, work hard to understand the way others see things. I can't think of, I mean, all of these are so perfect. We're... No one's asking, how did you get there? You know, I, I work with law enforcement some, and I, 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 I do training with them on different things from different angles. And you, you talk to the FBI, you talk to hostage negotiators, they'll tell you, you're never going to get a hostage out alive if you don't convince the hostage taker that you understand why they took that hostage to begin with. That's the number one predictor of whether or not you're going to get those hostages out alive. If they understand that, okay, he gets why I took these hostages to begin, whether it's for political reasons or you've been hurt or what, once they understand, Glenn understands why I did this, then you've got a chance of getting them out. Hey, he gets me. He understands why this happened. That's when you'll get them out. They need to know they've been heard, that you have heard what they have to say, why they did what they did. 
we, we need to work hard at making people understand we get them. We see things through their eyes. We don't do that enough. No, in fact, we do the opposite. Yeah. And then the last one, number 10, is treat yourself and others with dignity and respect, which seems so simple. I mean, you could look at that and say, what, did you run out of 10? You need, you need one more? <laughs> no, that is not as easy as it sounds. You can't give away what you don't have. Mm-hmm. If you don't treat yourself with dignity and respect, you can't give it to other people. Let me change subjects here. Um, You're just talking about hostages. And I I feel as though some people are hostage to their own normalcy bias or confirmation bias, and, and you just can't get them out. Let me take a situation that is political and don't make it political. Donald Trump is seeing jury after jury after jury. In Washington, in Washington D.C., he's going to be at a jury pool. Only 6% of the population voted for him. Okay? If you were advising, how do you get them to understand the case in, from his perspective? What would you be advising his attorneys? I would absolutely do what I call plaintiffing the defense. You have got to put the prosecution on trial. You you don't you don't want to go in there and defend Donald Trump. You want to put the other side on trial. You you need to you're going to you're going to come off a whole lot better if you can flip the script and say we need to decide what the motives are of the other side of this case and i would be asking them to say to ask themselves you're a first draft historian here what are you going to write are you going to put together uh, a, a case here where you are bringing uh, this case in a in a way that is actually uh, going to alter the the course of American politics, or are you going to let the electorate make a decision? Um, and and I think you have to put the other side on trial. I think you'll do a whole lot better by plaintiffing the defense instead of defending the defense. I I think you're a lot better off if you put the other side on trial instead of defending your guy. And is that because? 6% voted for your guy. Let's talk about, you're coming to um, Texas you're starting a new network. And, um, well, tell me about the network. Well, it's Merritt Street Media, and um, it's a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week network. We're launching on April 7th. That is hard. It is more than hard. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're going to have four hours a day of news, and the news is going to be factual. Uh, It's going to be based on, you know, in empirical fact and let people decide whether they think it's good news or bad news. Um, That's up to them. Um, And my show is uh, nightly uh, in prime time. And um, we we have a lot of others that are involved. Um, uh, Nancy Grace is going to be on. She'll be uh, kind of at the top of our true crime uh, vertical. Um, Micro is is on. Uh, Bear Grylls is on. Mm. Um, we've got. Uh, there will be some of my shows from daytime. We'll have some legacy programming. Um, got a really interesting show from the Behavior Panel. I don't know if you've run across these guys. They're no. guys I've worked with from law enforcement. That um, they're from the military, homeland security, law enforcement uh, guys that are really experts in deception detection and interrogation 
and all, and uh, they're going to have a really good time analyzing um, people that, from politicians to oh my gosh, pop, is that great uh, to, to every walk of life, um, and these guys are the best in the world. Um, I mean, they get down to pupil dilation, blink rate. Um, wow. You know, there are some things, if you're interrogating somebody and they're lying, 90% of the time their feet are pointed towards the exit. Uh, there are just things really? that people just don't know. If you're, if you're lying, your blink rate goes from an average of 15 to into the 70s or 80s. I mean, it's like playing whack-a-mole. There are so many indications and signs that even if you know them all, you can't control them all. And it's really interesting what we get into with wow. these guys. There's lots of things like that. So um, it's uh, it, it's going to be great. And uh, we think we're going to launch into uh, somewhere between 75 and 90 million homes day one. It's um, Wow. It's, it's going to be What's great. What's the network called? Merritt Street? Yeah, Merritt Street Media. The call signs when you pull it up on DirecTV or DISH or whatever will be Merritt. Uh, and that wasn't chosen at random, as you yeah, might yeah. guess. <laughs> so let me ask you. I mean, I built this, and I'm 60 now, and uh, I built it at 50, and it damn near <laughs> broke me. Why? Why? You don't need the money. You don't mm -hmm. need the fame. Why are you doing this? Um I asked myself that once, in, once yeah. in a while. I mean, how's you know, that working out for you? <laughs> yeah. You know, Glenn, I, I really, it's, um, I, I tell people if, if you don't have a passion in your life, you need to find one. And you're, you're right. I don't, I don't need to do this. I want to do this. I'm more excited about launching this network than I was when I launched Dr. Phil back in 2002. And that was very exciting. Why? Because I feel like this country is really in danger right now. I feel like we are under attack from within. Um, and I, I think we've got a lot of things going on right now that I have relevant information about. I think I have some things to say. Uh, I remember, you know, Roger King. You remember Roger King? Uh, he was king of syndication. And I, I remember mm -hmm. right over here at the Four Seasons out in the... Las Colinas. Yeah. Um, that was the first interview I gave when we was getting ready to take the show out to sell. And for people that don't know, when you're in syndication, they sell your show market by market. Now everything's so... Yeah. Now it's group. six or seven groups. It yeah. used to be 200. Yeah. You know, it'd be maybe three or four big groups, but then the rest of it... Uh, you went market by market. But I remember he said, all right, we're going to make a pitch reel for this show. So sit down there. We're going to ask you some questions. And the first question he asked is, all right, what's the show going to be about? And I remember the first things I said on camera about it, I said, I want to talk about things that matter to people who care. And mm -hmm. I, I didn't plan that or think, but it just, it just came out. I said, I want to talk about things that matter to people who care. And I want to deliver common sense, usable information to people's homes every day for free. And how can that not work? <laughs> and I was right. I mean, if you talk about things that matter to moms and dads and husbands and wives and, uh, you know, whoever, and those things that matter have changed. As I said, when smartphones mm -hmm. came out, it changed. And over the last few years, it's changed to include more social issues than it used to because so much is going on. Uh, people are concerned about immigration. They're concerned about so many things that five years ago, it wasn't on their radar as yeah, much. I was, I was surprised to see you down on the border. And you were, yeah. you were clear uh, yeah. on, on that. Um, You've been clear on a few things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not one to, you know, like I said, be who you are on purpose and, and, and do it with intention. You know, when I was asking those guys about that, uh, I said, why haven't you talked about this? I said, nobody's asked us this question in this point of fashion. Uh, you know, I said, are we sending children 
off into prostitution with tax dollars? They yes. said, yes. I said, you, and it's not in the clip. I said, you use a camera. <laughs> you know, you, you're on camera, right? Right. And he said, yeah, I know. I'm glad you're asking. In fact, in, in the clip it says, I'm grateful you're asking. Um, nobody's asking. What the hell? Nobody's that. What are, you, are you kidding me? Um, so I'm asking questions that I think people need to hear the answer you to. You said you wanted to reach a more broad audience. Mm-hmm. Um, things that are political do, in this day and age, just narrow. I mean, they will. <laughs> I know you've been through the ringer. You haven't been through the ringer yet. Uh, it's it's a... Uh, it, what what audience was missing, first of all, that you didn't have? Well, when you're on in daytime, you know, 90% of your audience is female. Um, okay. And um, a lot of people are, are are working during that time. And, you know, they can record and watch it later. And we were one of the few shows that people recorded and actually did watch. Mm-hmm. Our number changed to uh, Live Plus 7. Mm-hmm. changed, for, you know, significantly. But... I think being on in prime time, uh, I can speak a lot to the male audience. I can speak a lot to those Americans that are out there working hard and now they're home and can watch the show uh, organically. And um, uh, so I, I want to do that. And um, I like having a news department where if, if something's breaking, I can walk over there and join them and talk about it. And I, I'm not a news guy. I don't know anything about producing news, but I've got people in there that do. Mm-hmm. I'm real good at surrounding myself with people that are a lot smarter than me on yeah. things that I don't know about, and I don't have any trouble acknowledging that. And and you're right, people are going to take pot shots at me when I talk about Israel and the border and stuff like that. Uh, but I've never had a need to be loved by strangers, uh, which works out great, <laughs> doesn't it? That's it does. coming handy for you. It really it? does. It really is. <laughs> You know, if you believe in what you believe in, that, that's all that matters to me. I, I believe in it, and if if somebody checks my facts and I'm wrong, I'll say, hey, somebody checked my yeah. fact and it was wrong, and here's the right one. I, that's all right. I remember um, my first um, interview with Roger Ailes at Fox. I had had dinner with him a couple of times, and he was a delightful man and yeah. a great storyteller. And then I went to an interview, dinner, he was totally different. And uh, he didn't talk to me at the table for maybe three minutes, just silence. And I sat there. And then he said, uh, so, what do you think of the 1972 China Accords? I know nothing about it. And I, I thought, well, I'm just going to tell him the truth. Don't know anything about it. Hmm. He didn't talk to me for another three, four minutes. Next time he said, uh, what do you think of the international relationship uh, uh, that was fostered by the Eisenhower administration? And I sat there and I looked at him and I said, I got a choice right now. I could bluff and hope that you won't notice that I'm bluffing, but you're too smart for that. Or I could shut this interview down right now and just tell you, I got no idea. None. He said, which one are you going with? And I said, I think the second one. He didn't talk to me for another five minutes. And then he just started pummeling me with questions that, I mean, I think I lost 20 pounds of sweat. You know, just... uh, (laughs) And I got up from the table and I thought, well, this has been a total train wreck of an evening. Instead, he stood up and he shook my hand and he said, it's very rare that you get to meet a man who knows what he knows, knows what he doesn't, and is willing to tell you the truth. And uh, I, I don't think, I think people worry too much about other people. Yeah. And they want to be right or have the answers or look smart. Yeah. It's so much better when you smart people know when you're bluffing. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I I used to train witnesses that were CEOs of you know Fortune 100 companies and we'd put them up on the stand and cross-examine them before trial 
and ask them a question they didn't know, and they'd try to say, well, uh, blah, blah, blah. And so, wait a minute. You, you don't know. Say you don't. Well, I'm a CEO. I should know. No, you shouldn't. You don't have to know that. Just say, I don't know. Uh, I've got people that do know, and I, I can make them available if you want, but uh, I, I'm not involved in that, but I support the people who are. And the jury will love you for that. Hmm. Just saying, I, I don't know, but I support the people who do. They're the people who do. And they'll they'll love the fact that a CEO says, I don't know, but I support those who do. And they'll love you for that. And, and once we got that beat through their heads, they, they were great witnesses once you get them to realize it's CEO-itis. Yeah. And uh, we used to train that all the time. And I think everybody has a little bit of that now. Oh, everybody. Yeah. Everybody feels like they have to know, or they do know, and yeah. they don't know. And they don't know. They don't know. And they'll get in trouble. Dr. Phil, it's been great. Uh, I really be, enjoyed this. Yeah, me too. It's going to be nice to have you as a neighbor. I can't believe it's been this long before we've ever sat down I know. and uh, I know. because we've been in Oh, I know. I, I, was, uh, I was at the, it was the Paramount lot that you were on, right? Yeah. I was at the Paramount lot. See this gigantic building with your face <laughs> all across yeah. it. I mean, it was, yeah. it was quite a run I, I i loved it there and uh i've had a great relationship with cbs i still have primetime shows on with them mm -hmm. and um they've been great partners we we're still in business together have a great relationship and uh we were the longest running show on the history of the paramount lot and they are 105 wow. years old wow and, uh, well, that's a lot of history on that lot too. we were on stage 29 and um uh, when I walked on the set for the first time, they were getting ready to take down a picture of Lou Alcindor, not Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. It was when he was at UCLA. He had his picture up there, and it was kind of turned sideways. And I said, what is that picture up there? And they told me, and they said, how did it get there? And he said, well, um, Arsenio Hall hung it when he was here. Wow. And I said, really? And they said, yeah, he was... Um, he was the longest show to ever last on this stage, stage 29. He was here for five years, longest run ever on this. I said, do not touch that picture. <laughs> <laughs> do not touch that picture. And we were there 21 years. And when we left, I brought that picture. And it's now hanging on my new set. That is great. Merritt Street Media. Yeah, that is great. And when my son launched the doctors on stage 30, Next to us, I had one of those pictures made and hung it at the same angle on stage 30 that right next door. So and he great. was there for, I think, 14 years. Wow. So that's a, uh, I tell you, you need to get one of those. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I get one. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Glenn, thanks so much for having me. God bless you. Thank you.